multi-instrumentalist, singer, songwriter, producer, and engineer, Aaron Archer, joins us in the studio for an interesting conversation about his process in creating original music and the gig life in Vegas on this episode of Vegas Rocks, the podcast. Total Design Studios is a Las Vegas-based web design company that has been in business since 2000. We are a full-service design firm offering WordPress web design, e-commerce solutions, custom social media posts, video production, voiceover services, and so much more. If you're in the market for a design company that can help you grow your business, then contact Total Design Studios today at 702-433-6815. Visit us online at totaldesignstudios.com. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hello, my name is Aaron Archer, and welcome to the Vegas Rocks podcast with Adam and Cherry. Perfect. Nice. Yeah. I'm really just interviewing replacements when I need to take time off. Actually, what that's all about. <laughs> welcome, Aaron. Finally, we get together. Yes, okay. thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So we, we just wanted to start off with asking you for a few personal biological, no, not biological, bi- <laughs> biographical questions. I am a multi-celled organism. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Um, we just kind of were wondering how you even landed up in Vegas. What brought you here? How long have you been here for? Tell us about yourself. My parents fucked here. Really? Nice. Are you born and raised here? <laughs> I'm actually fourth generation Las Vegas. Wow. Uh, my we great did grandfather not know that. moved here to work on the dam. Um, Get out and of town. And my too. family's been in and out of the city for over 100 years. But I was born on uh, women, uh, I was born on uh, East Vegas. That's, That's awesome. That's cool. We always like to meet. <laughs> Um, what do you guys call yourselves? Natives. Natives. Adam's well, I, I've also, lived a lot of other places. But I'm Adam's from also born and raised here. Yeah. So yeah, well, cool. Yeah, the golf tournament we just shot. The guy said his grandparents lived here, and he's got to be in 70s? his early seventies. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so I'm like, wow, yeah, you got me beat. <laughs> My parents came here in '68, so yeah. Cool. So many memories of uh, going to Wet and Wild as a child. Oh yes. <laughs> Did you ever get anyone ask you what hotel you lived in? Cause oh, I, all, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and do you live in a hotel? No, not at all. Not anymore. I barely go to hotels. <laughs> Unless they pay you, huh? <laughs> I only go to the strip if I'm working. We don't really frequent the strip a whole lot, especially now that it's hot and yeah. hard to get around. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so um, I know that you did go to college here. You went to the university. I went to the University of Maryland Parkway. Come on. Is that really what it's called, guys? Don't UNLV. Okay, that's what I thought. I thought it was UNLV, but I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's some little college called Merlin Parkway. I'm not from here. That's a Vegas so. in-joke. Yeah. You guys are jerks. Fine, take over. <laughs> Tell me what you did there. Um, well, I just went to went because uh, Mom wanted me to. I chose journalism as a major after a couple of years purely because I was already working as a journalist. Oh. Oh. So I, I started writing professionally when I was 18, so they made me pick a major, so I'm like, I guess I'm a journalist. So where were you working at? Uh, Las Vegas Weekly and then Las Vegas City Life. Cool. Nice. So th- were those, are those Greenspun? Yeah, the we- Weekly is Greenspun, I believe. Okay. So um, were you trying to pursue music before that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've been a musician since the age of like 10. Okay, wow, that's awesome. And then, like, music and writing are like the, the two things my talents seem to go naturally towards. Yes. Um, yeah. So I, they kind of run concurrent. So going into journalism made sense for you, obviously. Well, it, <laughs> interesting story. Um, so, well, so, somewhat interesting. So <laughs> I was interviewed uh, by a staff writer at Las Vegas City Life for a band I was in when I was 18. Ah, so I had a, had that contact. I went to see the Strokes play at the House of Blues in like 2001. You went to the Virgin Megastore at Caesar's Palace and buy their CD and they give you free tickets. Oh. So I bought several CDs and scalped the tickets. Nice. Made a little money. <laughs> but I went there and I was, so, this is the Strokes at their height and I was unimpressed with their live show. And I was already a big fan of Lester Bangs, who was a rock journalist, wrote for Cream and Rolling Stone, and mm-hmm. very incendiary journalist. Yeah. And so I wrote this this screed about how much I disliked the show, and I sent it to my editor friend at City Life, like, hey, don't know if you want to print this. And she's like, this is actually good. Yeah, I'll print it. 
Oh. And then I became a journalist. That's kind of badass. I no like kidding. it. <laughs> and I was That's an 18-year-old cool. punk kid. Oh, I got I got lots of stories. I pissed off an A&R guy at Atlantic Records over Jewel. Um, <laughs> that, that's a really funny story. Okay, well, now you got to tell it. Uh, okay, so I was working for, I can't remember whether it was the weekly or city life. I was supposed to interview Jewel, you know, a preview. You do a phoner with them, mm -hmm. you get your quotes, you type up your article ahead of the show. All set to do it, and then they decide, no, she's not doing phoners. We're going to send you a pre-typed out interview, or a pre-done interview. Mm. And I was a little saucy at this. And keep in mind, I was an 18-year-old punk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I extrapolated her quotes and put them out of context and made her look like an a Oh, my gosh. Idiot. And the paper actually ran it. Nice. <laughs> and the A&R guy from Atlantic Records called me and, ba and actually said, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, I thought it was funny. <laughs> Did you, someone read it before they put it in the um, print? Do you know? Can oh, we, can we yeah, access no, my this editor, article? <laughs> my, I think you can find it online. My See. editor loved this shit. LL Cool J called me a fruitcake once on, on a phone interview. <laughs> so, like, I, I, I got up to mischief as a teenage journalist. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, you said you were into music, though, about the age of 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started playing instruments. So what were you playing 10. at 10? Saxophone was my first instrument. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, you play a lot. You play pretty much everything. Well, I, I, I'm a really adept at three, and then there's a few that I'm okay at. You're okay at? But I, I started playing guitar when I was 12. Gotcha. Okay, and then what else? What else um, do you play? Well, bass after that. Um, started playing drums when I was 16. Um, other stuff I picked up on. A little bit of keyboards. Um, mandolin, I'm pretty handy at. Mm. I inherited my grandfather's uh, vintage Martin Mandolin, 1913. Little nice. So, um, lap steel, I'm, I'm a pretty good Ooh, slide player. That's pretty cool. You know, either that or you know, bottleneck yeah. style. Neat. Um, I sing, I engineer, I produce, I write songs, but I'm sure we're going to get to all that. That's yeah. cool. And you said you got your grandfather, so did your family have a musical background? Um, my, my, uh, my, one of my uncles, uh, was a trumpetist. Actually, my, my grandfather played in, played with Eddie Arnold, he was his trumpet player. Oh. Um, my, my other grandfather was a mandolin player. He was from Italy. Hmm. From Rome. Yeah, so there's a bit of it, but I'm, I'm basically self-taught. Nice. I was just going to ask you that. Did you take a whole bunch of lessons, or were you... No. Uh, I took like a, hand, uh, a handful of lessons when I first started on guitar. Yeah. I remember the first riff I ever learned was Come As You Are. Right, really easy. It was in a group setting. And then I took a couple of lessons. I'd basically bring the guy... Nirvana songs I wanted to learn and he'd show them to me and then after a while I was like I don't need to do lessons so I just bought guitar magazines and just practiced records um, I was in music class as uh, in high school mm -hmm. I moved around all around high school so I was in jazz band and orchestra band um, one of the guys I actually went to high school with was is a guy named Tosh Nabasi from a band called Animals as Leaders he's oh. like one of the most prominent technical guitarists Right oh, now. that's pretty hmm. cool. So, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of people that we talk to. I, I always just thought you had to take lesson, 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 year after year after year to get to be an actual musician. Boy, am I out, I'm out so, I'm so out to lunch. <laughs> okay, lessons are very helpful. It's how you apply it, mm -hmm. I think, and the time you put in. Yeah. Like for instance, there's a friend of mine who you guys know, Nick. You know, Burby. Yeah. That I, I, him and I are, are buddies, and I'm like, you know what? I, sh I think I want to take some lessons from him just to learn some, get exposed to new things that I don't do a lot. Mm -hmm. You know. So. Well, how does that translate though? Because, like Sherry said, you know, a lot of people we've interviewed, they say they're self-taught. When, so being self-taught, mm -hmm. you can pick up the guitar or whatever. You can, you know, play a song. You're able to hear it and kind of know what you need to play, but how does that translate into like your original music? How do you write that for somebody else to, you know? I know you played every instrument in in that last song that you made. Well, all my solo stuff, I play everything on. Okay, but if you were to play that live, somebody would have to play. Well, I'll, I'll, okay, like for instance, um, 
I did a, a trio gig last September. Um, Paul Martinez was on bass, mm -hmm. yeah. and my buddy Louie was on drums. So I sent him the songs, and I wrote out, you know, my little chord chart, and I sent that to Paul. Okay. And I'm like, you don't need to play exactly what I played. Here's the chord changes. Do what feels right. Oh, okay. You know, put your own interpretation on it. That's why. Okay. That's why you're playing. Because not everybody reads music, or not everybody. Yeah. Well, it's it's like my chord charts are just like, you know, the chords per bar. Okay. You know, it's D minor, F, whatever. So I mean, I'm not gonna notate it out note for note. Right. You know, I can read music. I don't do it a lot. So I'm yeah, that, at it. I think that's the question. How do you translate? You know picking it up and how do you translate that on paper okay so like say i'm learning a song for whatever band i'm playing yeah a cover song right i'll listen to it i'll figure out what the basic chords are and then it's just like my ear training that i've picked up over the years like okay what's the guitar doing what's the actual notes it's playing what effects do i need to use to get that sound okay yeah, because we're, that's we're not, fascinating. Yeah, like, we're not that's musicians, so well, that's... Because, like, one of my stocks in trade is not just playing the parts accurately, but getting a very similar tone. Like, I'm big into the right gear to get the right tone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But using my ear, you know, so it's not the exact same thing, but I can make it 90% of the way there. That's good. That's good. So... Would you consider yourself, and I'm only asking you this because I have you on social media, and you, you're you always charting and practicing. And do you, <laughs> Are you a perfectionist? Are you, do, do you, do I'm you? I'm a perfectionist up to a point. Okay. Um, you're I, pretty particular about, because you do work very hard when you're preparing for a gig. I think you do. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe not everybody puts it for me to see, but I, I appreciate being able to see that about you. Well, it, it's cool like I see. like to show the process, you know, the work that goes mm -hmm. into being a professional musician. Professional in air quotes. Right. You know? Oh, as soon as you get paid, you're a pro. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work to do that. Like, And my stock and trade is being able to cram three sets of material in a day or two. You know? So, which often happens in this town. Hey, can you sub in for me? Here's the set list. Doesn't that happen well, all the a, time? Well, a friend of mine um, had a good term. He called me a rescue substitute. There you go. You know, <laughs> you need a guitarist, you need a bassist, you need a drummer. Um, but yeah, it, I, I put a lot of time into it. But I also, I've done it so much and I'm experienced at it that I've got it pretty streamlined. Mm -hmm. And I try to get a song down within 10, 15 minutes. Wow. You know, soup to nuts. Yeah. What, even if it's something that you're, is it mostly things you've heard before? Or you're well, familiar with? Or, or can it, you do it, that with things that you are brand If I'm coming in cold, I, I can still get it pretty quick. That's pretty cool. If it's something I'm familiar with or played with, then it's just a matter of just buffing it out and just running through it. Okay. Like, for instance, um, I'm subbing with 90 Station on Sunday on Freeman. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've done that gig many times before. So it's just a matter of, I just sat down yesterday and played through all three sets just made some notes, some adjustments, like, oh, okay, that needs to tighten up. That's not quite right. Hmm. So to answer your question, I'm a perfectionist up to a point, but then it's like, you know what, That that's close enough, fuck it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, depending on time, probably, or your patience? Yeah, uh, time and patience. Like, yeah. okay, so what I found is you got to give the, the mind breaks when you're cramming that much material. So I won't, I'll won't. i work on some for 10, 15 minutes at a time. That's like, all right, I'm going to take a smoke break, or mm -hmm. I'm going to play video games for a little while. You know, you got to reset your brain. And then you come back to it, gives the brain time to absorb it. Right. Mm, okay. So, um, right now, I know that you're looking for gigs. Yes. Always. <laughs> Perpetually. Always looking for professional gigs. And you said someone called you a res rescuer. Rescue substitute. Rescue. rescue. Does that um, make it, like, harder that you, are, that you get known for that at all? Or is that... Is that I guess, is that good or is that bad? Or if is I have my druthers, I'd have one working band that's working all the time mm -hmm. and doing really well-paid gigs. I got a couple irons in the fire that are moving that direction. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, but it's hard to do in this town. So, yeah. like, if you talk to any of the gigging musicians in town who just do music, it's piecemeal work. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're just always trying to put yourself out there you know, you wake up to a text like, hey, you available tonight? Yeah. You available Friday, whatever. Um, I like the challenge of being able 
to jump into any situation. That's cool. Especially on different instruments. Yeah. Because I don't think there's a lot of guys that can do that in town. Yeah. Well. To <laughs> wax my own car. Wax my own car. I like that one. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's a unique challenge. Yeah. And it, it, it's a bit of a calling card, and it separates me. Mm-hmm. You know, it makes me stand out a bit. So you said you liked the challenge. We saw you at the Sand Dollar doing that 27 Club. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was fun. And um, it, is that, like, less stressful when there's a lot more planning involved? Because that was, there was a lot of... Okay, so my, my friend Curtis is the one yes. who... Yeah. And, and Kat, they, yeah. they produce that. Yes. Did, haven't you had them on? Yep, yep we've we had have, them yep, on. the vendors. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Curtis and I have been buddies for 20 yeah. years. I played bass in his band when I was 19. Oh, okay. Okay. And I've known Kat as long as well, so they're very good friends of mine. So when they do that, like, I'm always kind of, like, one of the linchpins and help them with it because, like, I just want to play. Mm-hmm. That's what it comes down to. I just love to play. Gotcha. So it's like, okay, I'll do guitar on this song, do bass on this song, do drums on that. Yeah. And I attend all the rehearsals. Because the rehearsals are just as much fun as the gig. Okay. I bet. It's, it's an excuse for musicians that haven't seen each other in a while to hang out. Yeah. True, true. Yeah, because we shot you uh, playing with Ian Crawford. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that was just like, Ian called Heart Shape Box, and there wasn't a bass player on the on the spreadsheet. So I'm like, I know it on bass, I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, be so that was such a and he had the wig. <laughs> yeah, everybody was like, "Where did Aaron go?" Yeah, okay, so that's why I said the humor. So I, I like ran. I was playing guitar just as me, and then the Nirvana sets coming up, and I ran out to the car, changed real quick, yep. just just to make it, just for a lark. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. That's my sense of humor. <laughs> so we've seen you play with. Um, we've seen you play in eighty station. Yeah, that's one of my main gigs. Pop, and then I've heard that you've played Led, Led Zeppelin, and then I. You've played Nirvana, and then we've listened to your originals. What is your, what's your forte? What's your pre- what's your preferred um, genre. type genre of music? What's okay. your, what do you love? Well, I listen to so much stuff. Hmm. I'm a rock guy, you know, just a basic fucking rock guy. Yeah. yeah. But I listen to a lot of jazz. I listen to classical. I listen to blues. Listen to funk. See, I said, is he blues? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I even said that to him I, today. I, listen to I, was metal. Like, blues-y. I was just listening to the first album Metallica on the way over here. Nice. I listened to 80s synth pop. Um, I, I, I cast a wide net. Mm-hmm. Just because I'll, I'll get overstimulated or bored with something, so I want to listen to this. What about when it comes to your own creations? Like what? Okay, so my, my songwriting. Yeah. It, I mean, you can hear, oh, there's an 80s influence, there's a 90s influence, especially 90s. Mm-hmm. You no, know, because that was when I was a kid, that's when I got into music. Okay. Um, but then it, it's kind of all over the place. It's a bit schizophrenic. Hmm. You know, um, like the new song is kind of like Sid Barrett meets David Bowie meets Rolling Stones. <laughs> that's exactly what, we that's what she said. She goes, yeah, it sounds like Bowie to me. Sounds exactly <laughs> like, you're kidding me? You sounded so much like David Bowie. Yeah, I was like, what? So like, in all right songs, they'll be like, okay, this fits in with my solo output. Then I also have like the Fremont Singles Club, which is another project. That's when I yeah. write a song. It's like, oh, I want this friend to sing on it or play on it. Okay. And it's completely different and it doesn't fit under me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or I'll write songs for one of my original bands. Uh, I'm in a couple of original bands, too. Uh, drop, Crom, drop those names. Crom Fallon and the P200. Yes. I'm the drummer. Okay. And, and I sing backup. And then I'm also the drummer for the Laissez Faires. Um, so, like, I'll write a song for the P200, which is kind of a, like a garage rock band. And I'll, I'll just start writing the song. I'll be like, oh, yeah, this will fit this. Hmm. And is that all originals? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, th- those two bands are all originals. Uh, P200's put out two records. Laissez Fairs has put out. I've been with the band as a drummer like five, six years, something like that. Oh. And since I've been with them, we put out two or three records. They put out like five or six. Yeah. And then mm. you have also a few other. Um, you have a duo. Okay. Yeah. So so work, back to the working stuff. I have a duo with my girlfriend Bridget Riley. Yes. A two B. A two B. A two B. Like Prince would spell it. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then we have the full band version, B R B. And we just played Tennessee's uh, last Friday and Saturday. And we got a five night run coming up in Mesquite. Oh, next nice. month. That's fantastic. Great. Um Okay, I believe I believe that's the end <laughs> that's of the, a, that stream of thought. <laughs> that, that's a lot. That's a lot though. That's enough. But yeah, uh, um 
I just remember the root question genres. Um, I like so much different kinds of music, and I get bored playing one type for too long, so it's like, I'm going to go do this. Okay, so your your latest song that is going to be released in August. Yes. August the 3rd, Blacked Out. Yes. Tell us about that. Okay. I wrote that in, oh, it's a bit old, 2019. Um, I <laughs> was living in a very shabby apartment and being a bit of a shut-in. So that's what that song's about. Mm -hmm. It's about being a shut-in and being kind of okay with it. It was prescient because it kind of, you know, alludes to the pandemic in hindsight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you can interpret You're it that way. You're a fortune teller. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 <laughs> totally. can, you can interpret it that way. But um, when I started writing it, it was like, okay, this kind of reminds me of Sid Barrett. I wrote the first section. So if you look at the structure of the song, it opens with like a chorus, mm -hmm. right? And then it goes to a verse. And then it goes to a different chorus, right? And then it wraps it up at the end by going back to the first chorus. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like palindromic. Palindromic. What does that mean? Like palindrome, a word that like, reads the same forwards and oh, backwards. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right? I and I was thinking that when I was writing it. I was like, okay, structure it like a palindrome. Hmm. Have you ever sang it backwards? No. <laughs> <laughs> Had to ask. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so I recorded it uh, just at my house. Like when I do, you want to ask me about how I do my recording? I do. I, yes. So that that's something that Adam wanted to know about because ask me, Adam. He yeah, loves he loves the whole computer end and the whole production end and the whole yeah. Because um, when I saw the, your credits mixing, at the bottom, yeah. you know, written, sung, performed, engineered by Aaron. And he was yeah. like, "Come on, this cannot be true." <laughs> yeah. He really did. He was just like, "What?" Okay, yeah. so ask, ask. What What's your process? What's my process? Okay. Um, are you familiar with how Dave Grohl made the first Foo Fighters record? Ooh. No, um, but where my experience was, I was shocked that one person could do it, and the first person I heard it was Lenny Kravitz. Okay. Because he used to do everything in the studio himself, and then the band just went when he went live. Okay. You know, so that was my only experience with that. All right, so Lenny Kravitz, Dave Grohl on the first Foo Fighters record. Okay. Paul McCartney on a lot of wing stuffs, including Band, band on the Run. Okay. Elliot Smith, who's one of my favorites. Um, you just use the multi-track facility to its best, and you just layer tracks. Okay. Dave Grohl goes to record the first first Foo Fighters album, late '94. Okay. Nirvana's done. Yeah. Kurt's gone. Get himself out of funk. Books time in a studio. Wants to just record the songs he's written. What he did is he goes in there. He knows the songs well, so well. Forwards and backwards. Palindromic. Palindromic. <laughs> you lay, he lays down the drums first, just hum the song in his head, right? Then you put the rhythm guitar down. Then the bass, and you just layer it from there. And okay, but are you, say you do the drums first, mm -hmm. are you listening to the drum track while you play the other instruments, or... Okay, so that's, that's how Girl recorded that. Okay, that's... I refined it just a little bit for myself, is I'll do a, a guide track. So okay. I'll... I'll Play the song to a click, just me and acoustic guitar, just boom, 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 boom. tap my foot to the track, click track. Then I'll do the drums, okay. listening to that. Then I'll add the rhythm guitars and bass, and after a while I can just get rid of the guide track. Oh. And oh. I'll, I'll keep the click, but I'll get rid of the guide track. And, and then, then just, do you do the vocals last? I usually do the vocals last. Yeah. Because they're the least important. Because <laughs> I'm a guitarist. That's funny that you say that. Because when you when you talk about how you um, like listen for a note or a sound or I that I do not have that capability. All I hear is the words. Mm -hmm. See, and, I feel and terrible. I'm more like you. Uh, if if we're watching someone and I recognize somebody missed a note or changed it, but like I don't even hearing, know where the sound is coming from. Yeah, time. hearing. <laughs> Hearing like song lyrics, mm -hmm. it's hard for me on a song to actually hear the lyrics or understand what's going on. I hear the music more than I hear the lyrics. So like on, you know, when you had your band camp up and I could actually read your lyrics as I'm hearing you sing the song, yeah. that helps me. Well, for the longest time I didn't want to type up my lyrics, but you know, I, I, I'm, because I'm a writer too, I'm pretty good at lyrics. Yes, you know? yeah. yes. But, um... <laughs> It's interesting what uh, 
people grab onto whenever they listen to music. You grab onto the words. Totally. You grab onto the sound. The sick ass guitar yeah. solo. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I I do some <laughs> like, yeah, like a a catchy tune, right? But if if a song's important to me, it's mostly because of what it's about before mm-hmm. how it. Because hey, even if we're listening sound? to music in the car, she's singing every word, and I'm like, when she says it, then I can hear it in the song. But just because I know almost all the words to almost all the songs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's obnoxious. <laughs> the Google of lyrics. <laughs> so that's the basic process. Like my first record that I put out, I did basically on a little eight track porter studio with two microphones. Oh, okay. That's it. Okay. I've gotten some better gear and I've gotten better at engineering yeah. over the years. But basically, I'm using my mixer as a tape deck and I'm playing along a click. If I blow a take, I redo the take. Oh. I hate having to edit in post. It's tedious. It never sounds cohesive to my ear, especially mm-hmm. drum tracks. Yeah. When you edit and you can hear the little skip or whatever. So I play a take all the way through. I'll do some punch ins here and there for guitar or vocals. Right? Drums are always one take all the way through. Okay. If I fuck it up, I just do it again. Start over. And I've had some frustrating moments <laughs> over the years, like where I've blown 30 takes before I get the one I want. Oh, on, man. Right? Yeah. And it's so frustrating. Then I dump it into the computer um, and just mix in the computer. So that's how Blacked Out was done. Okay. What? But I remember an interesting little thing with that. I had a friend play drums on the first, on the master take. And great drummer. D- very different style on the drums than me. More, yeah. more of a jazzier drummer. And I was like, mm, this isn't punching how I want it. So I made the decision as, a, as the producer. I'm like, yeah. I'm going to redo the drums. Everything's already done. The click track's gone. gone. Right? So I'm like, oh, fuck. All right. So I set up. And I play to it a few times. And there's like one part where it stops time. You know, the beat drops out and then it comes back in. And I kept trying to nail it, like, just so, and, like, anticipate the guitars. And after a while, it's, like, a 30-second note, just a little bit off. And I could have gone into Pro Tools or whatever in the line. I'm like, fuck it, that's how it's going to be. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I don't like editing because I, I like old records. You know, I don't yeah. like how modern music sounds. Yeah. It's too perfect. Yeah, we talked about that a little you, bit, You should yeah. strive for perfection, not not achieve it yeah yeah because yeah, it takes the soul out of the music too i think precisely mm-hmm. a little more genuine when it's when there's a little bit of a yeah so and it's also me kind of thumbing my nose at how bad modern music is <laughs> you need six people well, to write a that song was, that was the biggest argument too when cds first came out mm-hmm. you know people all the audio files are oh it's too perfect you know it doesn't have any any imperfections in it so and that was done with with mu- music still made by people yeah you know, it was just in a digital format. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. I'm still and, debating and what, if I should learn to play an instrument or not. It <laughs> seems way too complicated for me. And what, what software do you use on the computer? GarageBand, because it was free on, on my laptop when I bought it. Nice. A lot of people I've heard use that. <laughs> it's 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 Logic Light, you know. Okay. I know what I, I I know what I'm doing, and I use my ears. Gotcha. You know, so. I like the challenge of like taking very rudimentary gear and making it sound really good. <laughs> that is part of the challenge. Do you do all that at home? Like you have all that set mm-hmm. up for yourself at home? It, it's a very minimalist nice. setup, but it, but it yeah. works. I I did that in my master bedroom. That's cool. Did you have to do anything acoustically in the bedroom? <laughs> like, do you I, sing in the closet? Because there's good <laughs> acoustics in the closet usually. I once cut up some UFC mats and stuck them on the wall in a mushroom haze. Yeah. Just to sound damp in the room. But other than that, no. No? Hmm. No, no, no. I, 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 I just... I know how to mic up well. Yeah. I read a lot of Jimmy Page interviews about his micing techniques and Eddie Kramer or what have you. So I know how to get... I, I try to get good tones to print. Okay. Rather than messing with it in post. Yeah. You know, so, and I like the grit and the, the cinema verite aspect of just making music. Mm-hmm. Nice. It doesn't have to be perfect. Like, I may not even think, oh, that's the best tone ever for this instrument on this song. It's like, that's how the song wants to sound. Mm. Okay. So how do you find if you, ha, have you ever written with someone? Yes. 
how how was that for you? Was that complicated for you? Was it? Well, it, you got to compromise. It's mm-hmm. a lot of give and take, and you got to know when to step back. Like, okay, so for P two hundred, if I write a song, I know my singer wants to be involved in the vocals. Okay. So I may write all the music, but I'll purposely not write the vocals. Just so. And I'll bring it to him. And the, there were actually three songs on the last record. It's like, we had the recording session coming up. He's like, we need lyrics for this. So he comes over to my house. And we sit at my kitchen table with an acoustic guitar. And we just have a lyric writing session. Banged out three songs in like a half hour. Oh, my The melodies gosh. and lyrics. When was the last time they put a record out? Um... Crom Fell and the P200 last put a record out in 2021, okay. I believe. And we're still an active band. We yeah, admittedly, we've never we've never listened to them, so mm-hmm. we'll have to check it yeah. out. Yeah, um, and we're going to be doing some songwriting sessions soon. In fact, I just wrote a new song. I was like, oh, that's a P200 song. Cool. It's like a punked up R&B song. Like Iggy Pop meets Wilson Pickett. Nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, when, when, when you write with other people, um, you, you just got to leave space for the other person. Right. While still being forceful about your ideas. Yeah. So it, it's a different experience than writing on your own. Well, I would imagine. Do you find that you, I guess you can't be a control freak. I would be a control freak a little bit, I guess. Because it's my ideas or my, I, whether I, I come in with a with a song or with... The music. Well, I have like, that tendency. Like, are you protective about that? <laughs> yeah, I have that tendency, and I gotta, you know, keep a leash on it. Yeah. <laughs> I can. I mean, I think that would be no, because I could just be like, "Fuck you! I'm gonna go do it all by I'm myself." Put there you go. <laughs> I don't need you. <laughs> but I mean, you, you get something out of um, collaborating with other people and playing with other people. Yeah. True. You know, my solo stuff. I. It's just how I do it. Okay, when I put out my first record, the whole idea was just to record the songs I'd written. Just uh, learning how to write songs, okay. right? And that way, it was to jumpstart a band, so I could hold a record up and be like, hey, I already wrote, you know, our first set of songs, who wants to play in a band with me? Yeah. That just never happened, so it's like, I just keep doing that. Occasionally I play live shows doing my stuff. Yeah. And it's very stripped down, like I'll do just a trio. Okay. And the guitar's a lot more louder, but when I'm recording, I like doing all the layering. Do you do you want to be a frontman? I've reluctantly become a frontman to a degree over the years. Yeah. I never wanted to be a singer. I just wanted to be Jimmy Page. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I wasn't even a singer for the longest time. You're an amazing singer, though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I, I just kind of learned singing by just wrote, um, working in cover bands. Yeah. Like adding a song or two. Um, writing my own songs, learning to sing that way. Like, I didn't start singing seriously till my late 20s. Wow. Right? And then playing with 80s Station the past two years, like, that really stepped up my singing game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because not only, it's like, you got to sing lead on, like, two, two three songs a set, mm-hmm. and you got to do all the backing vocals. So it's like, step up. You're not just a guitar player. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that really put it in overdrive. And then I'll do, like, ad hoc trios around town, you know, bar gigs or whatever. Yeah. And... <laughs> That'll be like, okay, dude, I need a guitar player who sing, who can sing all night. You available? Well, it, it makes you more marketable, too. I mean, you know, I, I, I never put two and two together that how hard it is for somebody to sing. Like, you know, you're out on Fremont and you got to sing all three sets like that. Mm-hmm. That's hard to do for one person. So it helps that, you know, you can come in, give the singer a break, you know, and that type and of I'm thing. And I'm not comfortable being a front man for an entire set. Yeah. You know, I much prefer <laughs> my vocals be a sideshow attraction. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm okay with singing, you know, a few songs, right? I don't need to be the center of attention all the time. I'm still going to stand out, but yeah. I don't need to be the front man all the time. So I've reluctantly become mm-hmm. a bit of a front man over the years. So if you had your dream of, you know, your number one gig that you could be doing, what would it be? Would it be with a band? Would it be a duo? Would it be a trio? Would it be a bang-up rock show? Would it be something more chill? Okay, my ideal situation, I suppose, would be I put out my own records. I have my own band. Other people like my songs enough that they want to record them. 
And then the big touring artists that actually have a budget mm -hmm. are like, oh, that guy's a badass musician. I'm going to hire him and take him on tour. That'd so all, nice. all those concurrently. That'd be nice. That would sure be beautiful. I mean, could have been a millionaire when I was 20, but that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> you may both. I was partying still when I was 20. <laughs> so Adam had another question about um, marketing and social media. Yeah, um, I notice a lot of musicians use Bandcamp, mm -hmm. and I'm curious, have you ever thought of putting your music on YouTube? My music is, on, I also use DistroKid. Oh, okay. yes. Okay. Yes. So DistroKid is a di distribution website. Okay. Basically, it puts your music out to all streaming platforms, i.e. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Tidal, Deezer. TikTok even now. Okay, cool. So my music is all out there. Awesome. Okay. On all major platforms. That's why I can do like a post on Instagram, like a... And put your own... And put my own music yeah. in it. You know? So it is out there. Nice. Bandcamp is just... Um, it's a good way to cohesively collect it, and it's a good way for people to actually pay money for it. Yeah. For music. Novel concept. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, that is why ticket prices are so high now, because yeah. musicians can only make money live, right? I guess so. I never put two we and two really together. We never really thought about yeah. that way. We just complained about the ticket prices. Yeah, because we always blamed it on the, the venue fees. Yeah. and all the taxes. Musicians, and, yeah, at least true. under the old record label system, you used to be able to make some money, and then you go play your live show and you make some money there. Yeah. No one pays for music anymore, so that revenue source is gone, so artists have to make the majority of their income from live shows. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So another example, if you get what you pay for. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's why a lot of the actors are are striking because all the streaming platforms, they're not getting the well, royalties. Well, le legislation to. has not kept up with the changing model of distribution right. yeah. for music or television or movies. It hasn't been modernized. Yeah. So someone's making money off you listening to music on Spotify, it's not the artist. No. No. It's the guy on the yacht. Yeah. Who should be eating. <laughs> Eat the <that> rich. <laughs> Eat the rich. Remember when Aerosmith put that song out? 94. <laughs> so what's next for you? What is next for what, me? What do you have coming up? Mm, Sub work here and there. Um, with working bands, i.e cover bands um, I'm putting the new single out mm -hmm. I already have another one done recording wise sweet um, so I'm gonna do that I'm pushing more on original music great because like it's, it's kind of slow right now for me with the working so it's like well use my time wisely and, mm -hmm. you know finish some songs so I got a whole bunch of songs um, ready to go um, working stuff uh, I doing Covering drums for Mach 5 at Golden Nugget on Friday. Um, mm. Some for 90 Station. BRB's got the Five Night Run of Mesquite next month in August, depending on when this is edited. Yeah. Um, and I got uh, a couple new projects in the fire for working stuff to get corporate gigs Ooh. and casino work. That's okay. great. Um, and I have another opportunity in the pipeline to possibly travel. Which I like to do. You oh. Know, travel and make music. Yeah. Um, and just avoid a day job. Oh, I love it. Yeah. That, what you just said, so if you didn't live in Las Vegas, where else would you live? Western Europe. Ooh. Oh. Like okay. German, Germany. Ooh. Or Denmark. Or Why is that? Why? I've always wanted to go there. Um, Europe seems more inclined towards music and supporting artists um have you been before no, no i haven't i was supposed to go to europe on september 11th but that didn't happen Whoops. Cool. um but no i like i i just always appreciate you know culture in western europe mm -hmm. they seem like they appreciate musicians more and i kind of want to get out of the states yeah hmm. so if I, if I had my druthers western europe okay interesting that'd be pretty neat. yeah I, I, I don't know for me growing up here you could never would, leave I could never <laughs> leave yeah no I mean uh, 
just, you know, we went to Montana uh, to see her kids, and the bar we were at, they actually have one here, too. I love this story. And it's 10.30, and the guy says, last call. <laughs> <laughs> What? What's what? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> you get your drinks. I, I don't know. It, I, it just there, there's so much freedom here. It, you know, it, it, it'd be hard to go somewhere else. Like you know, we, we like the outdoors. We go camping in Utah, but seven o'clock, the whole town shuts down. You know, what do you do after that? So it's it's those kinds of things. Oh, especially as natives, we we are spoiled. In well, it's not so much a twenty four hour town as much as it was before it, the pandemic. Before, day. yeah. But it's not? Is that what you said? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I used to do my grocery shopping at 3 a.m. Yeah. Do that oh, anymore. okay. Yeah, all the grocery stores. Good golly, is... I'm like, it's always, everything is always open but, here. But my, my yeah, I guess point so. is uh, we do get spoiled with Vegas, especially when I like go on tour for a little bit. Yeah. It's like, it's easy to get food whenever you want. Mostly whatever food. It's easy to get a drink whenever you want. It's easy mm-hmm. to do whatever at any day, time of the day or night. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. It's a pretty sweet town. If I could do that. <laughs> Can I ask you a few questions? Yes. Okay, so I met you guys playing down on Fremont Street. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. What attracts you to going down to Fremont Street so regularly? Um, mostly it's because we have like a kind of core group of friends that meet down there. Okay. It's sort of our social outing, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That would be our. I mean, we. It's free music. We're, we're friends with the bartender. We're friends with, and the bands. I mean, we did get to know, we did get to know the bands and mm. made friends with a lot of the people. So that kind of sparked this project, I guess. Okay. So that's kind of why we go so regularly, I guess. And that's where we met, was downtown. We met downtown. Okay. Yeah. But I yeah, was... we do have like a core group of, I don't know how many, there's probably like 15 to 20 of us now that, um... The majority are there on a Saturday night, and, we get and you're still out. going down there pretty regularly. Yeah. Um, pretty, 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 like a couple times a month for sure. Yeah. I was that weird? I kind of miss playing on Fremont. Oh, all we the miss time, you on Fremont. No, but uh, it's a challenge playing down there. Yeah. You know, in, in all the different seasons. Yes. Well, that's one of the things. Like, like you were saying, it's hard to, it's hard to play um, for three hours. Be, to be the lead singer for three hours, but then to do it when it's 110, when it's 110. <laughs> <laughs> or when it's windy is all heck or yeah. whatever. Like, yeah, like that's a challenge for or sure. Or when it's really cold. Or I, when you have to play a certain set. Well, I almost prefer set playing the in the heat because oh, the fingers still work fine. Okay. You know, you'll have a fan on you and you're just going to sweat. Yeah. yeah. You know, you just drink a lot of water. When it's cold, your hands kind of freeze up a little bit because mm-hmm. they true. don't want to work right. And like I'll always have like I'd have like one of those big strip heaters. Yeah. So just for a few seconds, just put my hand in front of it. Yeah. I'm okay, I can feel it again. But um, yeah, I'm I, I do kind of miss playing Fremont. So I, I'm I'm looking forward to this coming Sunday. Yeah, that's awesome. Station. Yeah, no, we miss we miss eighty station down there for sure. I know. Like, Tell your friends. Write a letter to your congressman. Fans, so yeah, but we did discover a lot of the dive bars in town too i mean we do go to the some of the casinos to listen to music once in a while but um taking in the smaller shows at the smaller bars have been a whole lot of fun too for us like sunset station is pretty close to here right yeah. yep 80 station has a gig coming up next oh. month i believe there yes. hey good to know yes. yeah yeah we've, we've done a few there we've done a few at the hard part with that Santa Fe. You know, if if you guys start at nine, yeah. you got to get there at like seven. <laughs> Golly, or there's you're not getting regular... a chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those places have a very big following of people that love to go to their to the local casinos. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you have to because we ran into there, it there and folks. Santa Fe. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, Santa Fe, since it's clear across town, we made it there earlier because we yes. didn't know how long it was going to take. Yeah, yeah. But we said, oh, you know, we'll leave at eight. Yeah. <laughs> no, we but just... it's good because you know that I, I think for the most part those shows have a good crowd because mm-hmm. yeah. those people that frequent that casino like to go to that casino. They're locals and, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that's a good part is then you run into a lot of people that you know too. If, yeah. If we, you know, we have our, we have a lot of our favorite bars and where we like to listen to music and yeah, it's pretty cool. 
But uh, I, I will say, you know, playing on Fremont, I did enjoy it, and it does make you level up as a musician and uh, a performer yeah. and all that, and just toughens you up, I suppose. Yeah, you yeah, see a lot a good down way there. To, yeah. Good way to look at it. <laughs> I mean, because, like, you're well, performing in front of thousands of people all the time. It's a different crowd every time. Yeah. And especially, like, when you're on the Main Street stage, and it's just, like, staring down an infinity tunnel. Yes. See, and, and that's what I've always said uh, when we had Paul Martinez and Daniel on. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, the, the thing about you guys playing Fremont is you put on a great show, mm -hmm. the same show, five nights a week. And if you didn't know, like, you know, we're locals, obviously, we know. But for the tourists, I mean... It's the first time seeing you. It's the time. first time seeing it. And you're like, oh, my God, this is great. And, which it is. Yet... That being said, we don't ever get sick of it. Like, no, no, no. It's, it's still going. No, it's none of that. I'm just saying. Once we I know commend the show, you guys. We, we can take part in the show, and I commend you, know. you guys for being able oh, to yeah. put on an amazing show and the same show five nights a week. I, I, I thought I would get bored with it, you know, no, if I were a musician, yeah. but yeah, with only a mere ten-minute bathroom break. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you guys are, I know. Run into the Golden Gate. It is literally enough time for a piss and a smoke. Yeah. <laughs> if that. <laughs> oh, I'd be smoking on the way there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, f funny enough, Paul and Dan from the Out There. The Out There. Yes. yes. Um, I actually have an unreleased song. Um, I I did a session with them. I had like this very Led Zeppelin song. It's still in instrumental right now. Kind of reminds me of like Houses of the Holy Era. Yeah. Like, oh, nice. Yeah. But I'm like, come over. I'm going to teach you the song, and we're going to record it live. So I, I still have the session. Oh and wow. And I'm going to finish that soon. But it's it's Dan on drums and Paul on bass. Cool. That's awesome. And we cut it live, and like I put up like you know mats for isolation, and I put them through the ringer. We did like a dozen takes. Nice. And it's like a complex proggy, like five minute song. I love when you guys say that you're collaborating together. That's just so well, fun. I mean, it was, that was just like, I got these buddies. You, you free the steak. Come over. Let's make some music. Yeah. yeah. Let's do some art. Yeah. You know, so we're not just playing Sweet Home Alabama all the time. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, I can't wait to hear that. That'd be pretty cool. So what are you going to play for us today? Uh, with my guitar. Well, do you want me to play the new song or do you want to hear something else? Um, want... I, I, I mean find my way I would hear you know several so <laughs> you, you want me to do two we would sure. love you to do two okay at least so I will do an acoustic version of blacked out sweet okay which is the single I'm releasing on August 3rd that will be available on Bandcamp and all streaming services I'd appreciate it if you go spend one dollar a single dollar on Bandcamp and purchase it cool and then I will play you an unreleased song oh um if I can remember all the lyrics. Okay, sounds good. All righty. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Oh, uh, oh one, yes. Yes, one more plug for myself if I Do can. Do it. Sure. Um, so I'm a multi-instrumentalist. I'm looking at the camera. Multi-instrumentalist musician, guitar, bass, drums, sing, for hire. So if you are a working band in Las Vegas or regionally or travel, what have you, and you need a guy that will do the homework, show up prepared, have good tone, have good time, and be a good hang, Contact me. My name's Aaron Archer. Yeah, and we'll link all of his social uh, media links in the description of this video, so you'll be able to contact him. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Greetings, Vegas Rocks Podcast. My name is Aaron Archer. This is my song, Blacked Out, that will be released as a full band single, i.e. full instrumentation, on August 3rd. Available on Bandcamp. Spotify, Apple Music, it's in the key of E. All right. <laughs> well, I wrote you this song in my head. I didn't bother get out of bed. No brush in my head, didn't comb my teeth. Just sick inside with self belief. Black crowns come and down, and the joker's always around. A cup of tea and a first cigarette, just marking time by paper cigarettes. What you think is a ball? Can't be much worse out the door. 
sweet to set in. And maybe tomorrow I'll begin with the windows all blacked out. Can't avoid time. A million rates all down. Write this down to back my mind. Sit with the thoughts, best denied. Stare in the hole into space. I'm down in the mirror and my face. Shutting loose. Well, I wrote you this song in my head. Didn't bother get out of bed. No brush in my head to comb my teeth. Just sick inside with self belief. The black rounds coming down. And the joker's always around. A cup of tea and a bus cigarette. Just marking time by. Paper cigarette. I brought you a song in my head. I sure as hell didn't bother get out of bed. I'm just stuck, 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 stuck inside my own head. I wrote that one. That's good. Oh, I like awesome. that. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> Vegas Rocks the Podcast is hosted by Adam and Sherry Martin Del Campo. This has been a Total Design Studios LLC production.